Thing. Evelyn, a very rare ban, except against teams who run it successfully. So Evelyn banned against Diamond, Ash banned against Genja. We don't see that a heck of a lot, except for Genja. He's he's the big yeah. Ash player here in Europe. And so um, it's fun to see that you're getting specific target bans more so than like, well, it's Jace, of course we're banning it. Exactly. And uh, that's that's really because we have three bands of pieces. You've got to take out those strong, those champions that you know each member is going to be strong on. Uh, Nunu taken away, Draven taken away from Makla. On the other side, Shen going to be removed from MYM as the last ban. Let's see if they take Elise out here or whether Meet Your Makers will have it as an option for first pick. I, I like the Shen ban especially because it it's... It's a champion that MYM won't play, right? All their bands are champions, they're not going to play themselves. And so they only limit the enemy options, they don't limit themselves. And there is the Elise band coming through. Gambit realizing that is something that they value a heck of a lot right here. Um, and Shen would have been such a good matchup against Kuban because he's so tanky, he's hard to root from the lane. He can keep that player locked up while not giving him any openings to go do something else on the map. So meet your makers here. Um, I expect a, a playmaker here still for Kuban. I, I almost would see like Ryze being first pick just because he'll work for Kuban and is a champion that Alex likes. Exactly. It's so, uh, removing an option while bringing one of your preferred champions in at the same time. And they're always the best uh, best pickups, in my opinion, uh, here in the uh, in any game of this caliber, that's for sure. Uh, so let's see then. Meet your makers. You can see there. Not quite as happy as they were in Champions Select last week. Twisted Fate was left open, and we're going to see that pick straight away in here for Meet Your Makers' as first pick. All right, so the double teleport Twisted Fate here, probably going towards the chart. It's true, he's going to yeah. run that. I mean, that is what they ran last, uh, I think it was last time. I remember seeing it at the, at He the very always least. runs it. It doesn't matter if he's got well, it. Twisted Fate had two teleport abilities, mm -hmm. he'd still have teleport. If he still had Gate and the Destiny also yeah. had Gate, he would still run teleport. Uh, but I mean, also, like, in the, specifically the last match that they played against Gambit, um, he did run Twisted Fate there as well. I actually got a couple the gigs there by running teleport and then destiny at the very end. I remember him dueling Genja under a turret one time with that one. So uh, I like that pick as well. It is another Alexich champion, something that uh, he's very, very good at. But again, you saw really that Meteor Makers didn't spend any bands in the mid lane because they know the champion pool is too big from Gambit's side. There's not much point to it. Well, Gambit here actually looking like they're going to lock in a bottom lane straight off the uh, go from this. And now Sona is a champion that not only Darker plays well, but Gambit loved to have in their cell. We saw it when Edward was, was the support player for uh, Gambit. And now they pretty much force him, I think, sometimes to play that Sona. Dark has already played it seven times so far here uh, in the summer split. Won four of those games. Going to be tidy with that Varus for Genji, of course. Had his Ash banned out this time. He's also played a lot of Varus. Six games so far he's had Varus at the, uh, his, 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 for his selection. Yeah, Genji's been playing these slightly more supportive type AD carries. Ash and Varus, the crowd control based ones. He's kind of there in the background with his team saying, look, it's it's Alex who's being a major carry whenever he plays champions like Zed. Darian, uh, when he does get to late game, still tends to do very, very well. And, and Gambit, especially when they beat, actually beat your makers very, the, the last time, they had actually this sort of slow roll tankyish team who said, you can't burst us out and we will just roll over you as the fight goes on. And so having persistent damage and durable guys and a lot of utility works well for this lineup for Gambit. So that Libic uh, Zyra support going to be locked in there. That's uh, you know, a massive pickup for him. It's his most played support champion. We know how good he is with that. Jarvan also going to be locked in for Makata here. And unfortunately, it's not going to be Zyra mid. I know Char plays it once in a while. The thing is, I don't like Zyra a lot as a heads up against Sona. Wow. Um, Wow. All right, so Annie begins to lock here. That's going to be all kinds of interesting. Um, certainly a lot of engagement potential here for Meet Your Makers. I think if they fight the bottom lane 2v2, it's going to be a little bit rough, though that can depend on what AD carry they bring in here. The Annie pickup, though, is going to be all kinds of interesting. Gambit have a lot of hard engage already this lineup. They're going to look to start fights. They can start them under turrets. And of course, we saw Bjergsen playing Annie last week for Ninjas in Pajamas in that middle lane. Wasn't the strongest performance out of them, but we did see a couple of times how dangerous that Annie can be putting down a full combo with the stun and the bear not to mention the other bear that they've now mm -hmm. got in there as uh, we are going to be seeing diamond once again taking udia so this is a really cool well rounded lineup for gambit they are a little bit bursty to start with tibbers they've got crescendo they've got the, the crowd control from all the members of this team so far but also their persistent damage is very very high recently we buffed the duration on tibbers and he's basically a walking like renekton at that point he has okay. really high aoe damage walks around and burns your team to death um, and if you don't kill off Tibbers, then he's going to bring your death. If you kill off Tibbers, you spend a bunch of damage killing a, a summon. Um, and so Gambit both has the initial burst and then a tanky lineup that can DPS you for a while. 
And of course, we've been seeing um, Diamond actually going Tiger Stance with his Udia recently as well, starting off Doran's Blade. And that's a lot of damage at those early levels to get in and uh, get those ganks off, which is where he's really excelled in the games that they won with him. On the other side, looks like Makla could be going for Cogmore Champion, which if you think right back to Intel Extreme Masters Singapore, uh, which feels like an eternity away by now, <laughs> was in fact only um, last November. Uh, wow, that is really strange to uh, to say, because that felt like uh, years ago, but yeah. he played a lot of Kog'Maw during that event, was very successful with it, and it looks like we're going to see the cannon in for Kuban as well. We talked about that earlier, that he likes those really fighty uh, champions in the top lane. So this is actually very similar to Meet Your Maker's lineup last time they played against Gambit just last week. The one really important adaptation, though, is the Kog'Maw ad, because what happened was Gambit was too tanky to actually die in teamfight. The repeated turtle shields, just Gambit refused to fall over in those battles, so now they've got a Kog'Maw. And Kog'Maw just belts out damage in team fights. If they can keep him alive, he will melt through the Gambit lineup. And I especially like that Jarvan works here now, because normally you've got to worry, can we keep Kog'Maw alive? There's a there's a Udyr running around that's going to make our life difficult. And Diamond a lot of times does run Ghost on this Udyr. And if you are Udyr with Ghost, you cannot escape Jarvan's Cataclysm. They can pin him down and make life easy. Ooh. Didn't expect that. Did not, and that's going to make his life hard. I'm not going to lie, I actually thought that he was banned out for this event, uh, for today. I thought it was four weeks. Obviously, I'm wrong, yep. because he's there. And he's we, did, we didn't dissolve the game and say, no, you picked wrong. So clearly, here we go. <laughs> Aatrox up in this one for Darian. And Aatrox is, it depends how he plays it, because Darian doesn't tend to play hyper carries. He's not like the Trindamir type of player, right? He plays guys like... Darius and, and Shen and Elise, tankier sort of guys with good base damages. So Aatrox, I want to see if he goes for like Blade of the Ruin King, fight the back loader, or if he is going to be a tanky bruiser guy in the front. And that's going to be interesting to see. First time, obviously, that we're going to be seeing him here uh, in Europe. He's not been selected in North America either up until now. Um, so first time, first time for everything. That's what I uh, what I like to see. And Darian, now he's he's a player that stays under the radar. You know, he's not one for streaming and putting on a big show and talking on social media about what he's playing and stuff like that that some of the other players are. So it's almost a sneaky pickup here of that Aatrox coming out and really excited to see what Darian brings to the table with him. I really like that sort of persona from Darian because he's like this quiet player who takes care of business. Um, it's it's weird, right? You'd, you'd never do hear from him. He, like, he, kind of, he kind of looks the quiet type as well and he sort of plays it as well. He certainly plays aggressive and, and, and pushes forward a lot. Um, it's... I don't know how to say it really properly, but I think he's going to be able to take care of business in this game. I think Aatrox is a great champ, but I think it'll be hard to fight Kennen. I feel like it's a little bit of a difficult matchup, but um, there will be spikes here. Like at level two, if Darian can prime his W, switch it to the offensive stance, and dive on someone, you can pretty much two-shot somebody. And when you consider you've got Diamond here on Udyr, who did go flash, by the way, but you can make ganks happen on Kennen and just destroy him. So we're going to be jumping into this one in a second. I'm sure that Aatrox is... Surprised Meet Your Makers somewhat, uh, yeah. as much as it did us in there. I mean, we saw Annie coming in, which was uh, enough of a surprise on its own here. I mean, we, it's not the first time we've seen Annie granted, but still not a champion that we've seen uh, use consecutive weeks in the past. Uh, but Aatrox coming out here, and because we haven't really got onto that one, as we get into this game, I think it's actually a pretty cool idea if we you know, just break down a little bit of what Aatrox is going to do for those that you know, may have not seen him or played him just yet. Exactly. So the first thing I'm going to point out is his Q ability, Dark Flight, is uh, is basically a... Think of it a little bit like uh, Zach's Elastic Slingshot. He's going to dive forward and, and get a knockup if he lands right on top of you. So he's got initiation there. And again, when you consider he's got Annie and Varus and Sona and Udyr guys with stuns, he's on his own crowd control. All of Gambit can start a fight, and that's great. His big important ability is Bloodthirst slash Blood Price, his W. Uh, basically, you can turn it on or off. When it's off, your third attack will heal you. And if you're below half health, that heal is tripled. So you heal a heck of a lot of HP. Just at level one right here, the heal will be worth about 67 health every third attack right there. If he's below half, it's worth only about 22 right there if he's full, so uh, it has some sustain. If he turns it on, instead of healing every third attack, he hurts himself and deals a bunch of bonus damage. Right now, right, he's got 67 attack damage right here. If he triggers blood price, it does an extra 69. So he's hitting you really, really hard with his auto attacks. Um, and the other main ability you want to think about is his passive, the blood well. Um, as he uses abilities and takes damage, he fills up the blood well. When the blood well is full, and you'll see that on his resource bar, it's going to be a red or a gray bar. When it's full, it's 50% bonus attack speed, and that scales linearly, so it's 0 to 50% based on the size of the blood well. Um, 
if he dies, he his blood well goes to zero, and he heals based on the amount of health in the blood well, and he he comes back. And that's got like a four minute cooldown. If the if the if the resource bar is gray, it means it's on cooldown and he'll die for real. If it's red, it means that blood well is open, and he'll revive and be all kinds of you know difficult to deal with. So, uh, frontline diver deals a lot of damage, comes back is hard to deal with. High damage source melee champion. And that's Aatrox making his appearance for the first time here in the LCS. And we can talk about the start of this game because it looks like Gambit are going for a switch and are already putting down some early pressure here towards that blue buff. Makata taking a lot of damage, did manage to smite that blue buff down though. Gendra and Dark are not able to get a steal on that one. Meanwhile, Diamond has picked up his blue on the other side. And again, you see it, Tiger stance going in with a Doran's Blade start. So a lot of early damage going to be available here for Diamond when he does decide to go in for ganks. Notice that Alex Itch also started Doran's blade and he has a 625 attack range that is the highest of any conventional mid laner here in league of legends he's 75 attack range above charo's twisted fate and that is sorry actually he's actually 125 above charo uh, or 100 above he's at he's at 525 base so alex can easily poke him out and then do a stun combo whenever he wants yeah, that Doran's play going to make it even more painful. Actually, Bjergsen was running armor pen runes uh, in that game that we saw him running uh, Annie last time around. Yes, and he's going to go for the same here. Hybrid pen marks. That's a lot of just difficulty to deal with right here. Eight, eight flat armor pen right there. And of course, a standard 21 offense from there for mages. But yeah, life will be difficult for this Wizard Fate. So. Bit of a quiet to start from this one. Obviously a 2v1. As I say, quiet. Alex each gonna flash in here on towards Charu. Put the ignite down as well. Doing a lot of damage, but not quite able to pick up the kill. Makata was there to push him away from things completely. But you see that even Makata at level three just can't deal with what Alex each can throw him. Actually, Makata gonna dive in there, get stunned up, and Charu was coming in from that backside as well to try and make an impact. They don't quite lock Alex up, but they've sent him out of lane, which is a bonus because Charu can stick around for a while. Now. Yeah, this is actually pretty important. Charo did go boots for potions, so he's going to be back up to full health sitting here in lane. Alex does not have flash and is on a Doran's Blade. He does not have sustain. He has no good way of staying in this lane. If Makate can just get a flash flag toss, he'll get first blood, no problem. Oh, Kuban in trouble here at the top of three man dive coming in. Flash from Ooh. Diamond, and there is the first blood. As he got the stun under him, a great flash coming out there from Diamond as well. Makata just started to come up there as well as Charu actually cancelled his teleport. He was going to get involved in that fight and decided not to. Yeah, it seems he was. He felt very, very outnumbered, was not in position enough with Makata. And honestly, when you've got Sona Udir and, and Varus ready to burst you out, you don't want to be 1v3 as a squishy twisted fate. And we see Aatrox with Darien right now. He's leading technically in this 2v1. Obviously, uh, we did see Ken go down a little bit earlier on. Still needs to be real careful here, but as that sustain we talked about his, uh, his kit and what he's going to be uh, bringing to the table just a little earlier. There's Diamond just switching out to Bear and saying, no, I don't want to get involved in this one, but he's going to get caught here underneath the turret. Switches out to Turtle for that extra defense as the Ignite is ticking away. Is it going to be enough? No, not quite, but Kuban's oh. not done. He misses the Shuriken, and he walks away with his life. The turtle shell also helping to keep him alive against the basic attack at the very end. They're very, very close right now. And Darien's actually waiting with Genja in the back. He's almost baiting for a turret dive to see if it happens. The thing is, Bloodwell heals over three seconds. You can't sit the turret that long without getting chucked out by the turret. Right now, Genja has come back down to this bottom lane, which tells me they uh, don't feel comfortable with the, how these 1v1s are going. They may be feeling as well that Aatrox is going to have a better time now that Kennen has died in the top lane. We'll see how that one all goes, but Diamond will surely be visiting that top again to uh, give Darian some help out. In the mid lane, Alexic, 26 to 23 CS, so does have a lead. It's not massive, though, at this point. Yeah, Gambit wants to put two people down in the bottom lane for two reasons, though. What, number one is I think their matchup is better. Sona is just a good pick against Zyra. Unless you get hit by grasping roots over and over again, you'll out-sustain and win the mana war. And plus, whenever you have the passive up for Sona, she one-shots plants. And so it's very easy to just limit all of the uh, all of the openings here for Zyra. Secondarily, they want to make sure that they've got people in the bottom lane by the time Dragon becomes a real objective that can seriously be considered. They don't want to get that snuck out from under them. And the fact is that Cogmore in a 2v1 can farm to his heart's content. And that's a dangerous thing going in towards the uh, later stages of this game. He's already got an 11 CS right now over Genja's Varus. So, it's mid lane. We've already seen Flash initiations from Alex Itch, which only going to get more dangerous as he hits towards that level 6 mark and Tibbers comes out and look at that, level 5, half of Charu's health gone. 
And right now, as Ignites is coming back up in the next 15 seconds right here, and that's going to be almost enough burst to take down TF1v1. The question really is going to be, does Charu itemize against Annie? Does he go for an early, like, Null Magic Mantle, maybe Twin Shadows to get some MR? Does he go for an Abyssal Scepter, or does he try to stomach it with just some Doran's, blades for, or Doran's Rings for health? Well, we'll be finding out right now. It's Doran's Rings at the start. Which you could probably expect from him anyway. Dawn Rings, obviously, now that they are cheaper as well, mm -hmm. make them uh, even more uh, viable from that side of things. Yeah. It's going to be nicely farming back up to exactly level with uh, what Cogmo has with, with the wave pushing in for uh, Michael's turret. We'll see about that one. But Alex Each now is level six, and I feel for the cameramen when there's a level six Annie with Flash and Ignite available because that can go down very quickly. Yep, have fun with that one, guys. This is uh, patch 3.8, so the Dorans, because you said, are cheaper. They're only 60 health now instead of, I believe, they were 80 before, so only 120 bonus HP from those Dorans rings. Not a lot. We'll maybe make them survive like half of one spell extra, and if, if it's enough, then it's enough. Uh, but yeah, here comes the real time that moves start getting made because ultimates are now available. Charu's teleports back up from cooldown. Of course, he canceled it earlier. He's got the Destiny as well. Um, and the thing is, they can gank without his bottom lane being level 6 because they've still got rank 3 grasp moves. They've still got the slow from Kog'Maw. He can make things happen if he wants to. There is Alex getting his blue buff. All the more annoying in this middle lane for Charu to deal with. He will be himself gifted that blue buff here in just a little while. Darian is still in the head, yeah, in the lead uh, with that CS as well. Doran's blade, uh, sorry, Doran's shield with those boots coming in there as well. Up against the Kenyu. Picked up a Doran's ring with his boots and a rejuve bead now. There's something I want to really point out here, though, that's interesting, is we talked about how rough this lane might be for Meteor Makers, but Mockler has 58 to 42 advantage right there. They've actually pushed the turret down as well. So because these guys have not had to run around the map but have had an easy 2v1 for the start of the map, they already had a head start in the lane, and they pushed it through. But I also want to point out that Genja went Tier of the Goddess on... Varus. Now, I understand it on Ash because her Q will charge it and he'll hit that full mana really, really easily, but he's gone for it on Varus because he still wants to spam out, but that's not easy to charge until he upgrades to actual mana Mune, uh, and he's at bonus mana 8 right now. He's got a long way to go until that turns into Muramana. I'm curious to see what actually happens with that build. Yeah, definitely not the champion that will stack it up so quickly, when you, especially when you compare it to his other main tier champion, that, uh, that Ash in there, of course. Top lane. Pretty quiet as things goes for the uh, top lane. I think both of them, there is a potential for a fight to go down there in that top lane. So I'm going to keep an eye on that one. But Makata right now getting a ward down right on top of Diamond. Who did, uh, I think, a couple of hits there. Couldn't quite get that third one off. But a very pensive game from both sides, really. Neither team wanting to give away an early lead at this stage. So here's the interesting thing about this. In the top lane, I feel like it's going to turn into a farm fest because Kuban can't burst Darien out twice. He can go for the ultimate and do a bunch of damage, but then Bloodwell happens. He gets back at about half HP and he just walks away. And the thing is, even if he... Even if he didn't have Bloodwell, there's still the Dark Flight to get away from an engagement here from Kennen. Uh, but Meteor Makers, surprisingly, are still looking to play aggressive. Even with an early game champion like Kog'Maw, they're pushing for the mid turret. Well, are they going to be able to stick around now? Because you've got Darian coming down from that top lane. He walked through a couple of wards, so they knew his presence was there. And he might lose a bit of farm for that one as the wave pushes up on towards his turret from this. Not that he'll uh, probably mind too much about that one. He just jumps over the top there. We'll get that one done. The Dragon, of course, we've uh, not until now. Ten minutes into this uh, second game of the day. Let's see if uh, Gambit they, uh, decide to go for that one. I mean, they are a team that like early Dragons. We've seen, especially with Udyr, in fact, uh, moves from Diamond where he said, okay, Dragon, right now they take a big opportunity where, you know, the bottom lane may have just gone back for, uh, you know, just one recall and they'll go for it. Well, Meteor Makers have made their opening because Gambit's recalling right now and MYM have a pink ward on Dragon. Now, Gambit, right there, Diamond put a pink ward himself in the nearby area, wanted to make sure he could see if Mim went for it. And the thing is, no one saw him put that ward down, so he will know that uh, MYM starts Dragon and no one will know that Gambit knows this. So. Uh, it's a potential opportunity for Gambit to stab Mim at the back at Dragon and get a fight out of it. Or Limbic saw it and I'm done. Nope. Well, he's moving in. And he does have a pink ward, so he wouldn't he's standing be in the brush. He doesn't know. To, uh, to do that one. He's got no idea that, that pink ward's gone down, so you were right with that one. Let's see if we can actually get Alex Itch here. Diamond just waiting off to the side. Thanks to that pink ward, knew that Limbic was going to be waiting in there somewhere. Diamond is once again going to have a wave under his turret. He's currently 10 CS ahead. 
Limbic starting to recall, and I think Diamond got itchy fingers, wants to come in there and interrupt him. <laughs> yeah, he knows the ward went down. He saw the particle come out. And actually, in the top lane, though, the Diamond from Darien. They are going to go in for this one. Kubon actually popping his ultimate from this. There's the slow coming down. And Kubon will manage to walk away from things as Alexia getting caught out in that mid lane. Puts Tibbers down on top of Makata. There's a stun out of Diamond. And look at the damage coming in. He's burning from the Ignite. He won't survive this one. And they're not going to have enough damage to take down Diamond in the process either. Absolutely great counter engage right there by Gambit, just bursting through all the durability that Makata had and just taking him out right there. Good counter engage there by Diamond, good burst from Alex, and uh, he flashed back and said, wait, I've still got what it takes to kill you, and went for it. And that, uh, that initiation from Dami uh, Darian on the top lane allowed him to force Scoob on away and allowed him to pick up that turret as well. So that'll be the first one coming over for Gambit, but they need to react to this one. They're taking a lot of damage on this middle turret right now with Twisted Fate and Kong hammering away. And that will be Meet Your Maker's second and that all-important outer middle turret. So here comes Darian down from the top lane. And the thing is, Kuban just now went back to the top lane. So they've actually got a power play right here on the bottom side of the map. All of Gambit are alive and healthy and can go for this dragon. Yeah, Diamond not worried about the plants whatsoever. Going to clear out that pink ward as well in there. And this dragon is going to be getting started off. Doesn't have his smite available, that's something to note. Makata does have his smite, but he's just gone actually over to the bottom side to pick up the golems. This is going to be a Gambit Dragon. It's theirs completely. You saw Kuban turn himself back around, realize he couldn't get there in time. Really well done. Darian, that was basically about a minute and a half planned ahead. You saw that. Darian pushed out his lane opponent, made sure he was full health, put a bunch of pressure on the turret, took the turret down, and then came and left, just went and left the lane and said, all right, you're going to go back up the top lane to hold onto that farm. We're going to have a 5v4 at Dragon. You can't stop us in time. CS has been brought back to even in this mid lane. A, a bit of a stark contrast to our last game where Twisted Fate obviously on Forelm Lord had a massive deficit throughout that matchup uh, in terms of his CS. And he obviously does have that one kill. Got that Hextech Revolver in there now as well. The endlessly large rod though on the other side coming out straight off from Charu. So there's a couple of interesting things right here. So Alex itches, uh, I want to point out one of the interactions with his abilities. So Disintegrate on Annie, for those who haven't played her in a while, it refreshes the mana cost if it kills the target. The mana is refunded. It's a single target spell. So it, it has full spell values. You'll heal for 12% of the spell's damage, and it's free on a four second cooldown. You'll get it for every minute you ever last hit. And so Alex can be at full health all the time, can happily harass and never take any losses here. Now Charu, he did actually pick up anal magic mantle, realized he needed some durability to survive this lane because there's gonna be burst from Annie, and it's otherwise going for offense. Yeah, we just saw in that top lane actually Twisted Fate Destiny in, and Darren, uh, Darren actually jumping away there, plus flashing away as well. He wanted to make up a lot of ground from that one, getting under his own turret. Actually staying safe as a crescendo comes into Libic. Gets sniped off Kenja though, missing the chain of corruption. And Libic's gonna walk away. He was just putting a ward down. <laughs> yeah, but this is Gambit. They're an aggressive team. They will happily take a fight if they see it right there. Any opportunity and they will go in. And again, every member on that team is empowered to be a playmaker. They all have an initiation ability and can start fights out if they see something. The rest of the team can follow up. So you're going to see this kind of stuff from Gambit over and over again. Right now they have not quite a uh, 2,000 gold lead, but that Dragon obviously helping out a lot in that one. Darian's still doing a great job with his Aatrox. First time that we've seen him here in the LCS, currently out farming Kubon's Kennen, who, again, was a, uh, a, a decently big pick for Kennen, uh, for Kubon so far. Obviously, he's been more uh, focused on the Elise, on the Rise, on the Zac picks, but certainly knows his way around there with Ken. We've just seen a pink ward put down by Blue Buff here, so it looks like Gambit want to take the next one away. Uh, they're going to look for this. I mean, they finally powered up at this point. They're the stronger team on the map slightly. They've got two kills. Uh, they're down one turret, but they're, they're winning in every other objective that you can think about. So this is this is a time for them to start making really big moves. Certainly they can they can dive turrets later on in the game, but if you can take early game, mid game advantages, you're going to want to go for it. And it's Darian coming down to join Diamond, trying to get full control. There's a ward that Diamond stood right on top of. It's not going to spot Darian, though, until he actually probably jumps over here to uh, get involved if anything wants to happen from that one. Kuban has come down. He's been spotted in there as well. Darian wants that little bit of gold for clearing out the ward. And he's going to get it as well. 25 gold bonus for him. Yeah, nice right there. So he's going to be happy to take a little bit of money and deny some of the, the, the cost that Kuban had spent there to spot that one out. So both teams realizing, hey, there's people lurking around in the shadows and they reset everything back out here. So I want to talk about Darian some more because 
Uh, we haven't seen Aatrox before, so I want to poison things out. He looked like he went for a 921-0 mastery build. He's getting dived, though. Oh, he's going to jump away, though. Did actually get stunned, and there's the ultimate coming out of Kuban. Darien going very, very low from this one, and he is going to get finished off. Look at the damage that he puts out there on towards Kuban. Obviously, going to be coming back to life there with that blood well. Is he going to get away from this one, though? Jumps off. There's another auto attack, and the blue card after the flash from Charu will seal it up. Libic getting very low. Tibbers going to be burning away with the Ignite Diamond. Comes in just to secure that one there in the end. But well, he actually wasn't Tibbers, it was just Diamond. Wow. Yeah, I mean, but the, but the Bears <laughs> working were in bears. unison. The bears, bears working in unison. If only a Vola Bear were in this team, you'd have all kinds of... It just... was Tibbers. I'm telling the lie. Tibbers was there. He was I there, yeah. myself. They worked together. It was teamwork. Bears everywhere. I gave him a bear hug. I'm going to move on. Gambit Gaming, though, they are still the stronger team in the map. You saw Darian, how much effort it took to take him down. And, and I was going to talk about his, his build right here, 921-0 Masteries. And he went for the early Bloodthirst. He actually maxed E and then Q. Now, E, I didn't talk about that ability, but it's it's a uh, fairly long-range, uh, slow line nuke here. And it allows him to wave through really, really well, so it can actually hold up in lanes against ranged champions. Uh, and it scales off AD and actually deals magic damage, interestingly enough. So um, he has really good long-range tools and, of course, could also dive in and start things out. But Diamond's going to get caught out. And he's going to get slowed down here. Charo not able to pull the stun card. And that Cataclysm, you know, it's stopping Diamond getting away. Makla got the range there with that Kog'Maw just about to get the auto attacks off. And that will be a vital kill coming out for Makla's Cog. And that was important coordination by the team right there to note that Diamond's flash was down. That, that, was, that was told right there. You normally don't... I mean, it's okay to waste Cataclysm for flash. It's a shorter cooldown, but I, I, I'm fairly certain they knew that was down, and they said, look, we can make sure we get this kill. We'll do enough damage over the three seconds. Got the team around there and said, all right, and go. And it worked out for them. Kill back did. four Meteor Makers. They're ahead in turrets there, slightly behind in gold here. Let's see how that one can change. Obviously, the Dragon not too far away from actually coming up from this. And Meteor Makers are going to be wanting to uh, challenge for that one next time it comes around. Maybe help now somewhat. The fact that Gambi are going to be sending that duo lane to the top side. Yeah, so here we go. It's it's more interesting movements being made right here with with Dragon being back up. That does tell me right. Each of us putting the duo lane at the bottom lane because they want to control that. Uh, there is a recall coming in from Genja finally from the top of the map because they've got to realize this is an important objective. The game is back to close, which is something worth talking about here. That it is uh, only what five hundred gold separating these teams. Either team can fight for this, but Gambit's there first. Gambit are there first, and they've got ultimates pretty much across the board available for this one as well. So, Meteor Makers probably be silly to get involved, and in the end, they don't come anywhere near that one. And that will be another one for Gambit. Second one of the game, and that gives them back that 1,300 gold lead currently. So, Gambit, just they're controlling the map, and that is so important for them. This feels like uh, a more early game sort of team. So last game we saw from, from Gambit vs. Meteor Makers, late game basically all of Gambit got too tanky to die to like Twisted Fate, Varus, and, and Kennen because they could... Varus is a burst caster. Or, not, sorry, not Varus, but, uh, but Kennen is a burst caster. If you can survive the Kennen burst and then just like, well, TF's not that high of a damage dealer, they'll just win the fight by attack moving at that point. And Gambit's going to look for something like this here. Well, going in on towards Darien with this one. There's a stun card coming down. Wild cards will strip him to pieces. And the passive not up for this one. He will go down in the end. And that's another kill coming down for Makla's Kog'Maw. Got that Blade of the Ruin King and the Zeal and Berserker Greaves already done. And that's so important for Meechamakers because he is the reason that they will be able to hold on to a late game situation against the tanky team. Kog'Maw specifically scales against tanky champions because of that, that bio arcane barrage, the W doing percent health damage. And so the rest, uh, the hopes rest on him for Meechamakers. Sorry, taken really easily though. The fact that the bear's right at the front, not an easy thing for uh, Meechamakers to be going up against. Don't want to you know, have the risk of him switching out to bear stance, that roar coming up into your face and giving you a stun. Can, mean the end of your life, especially if it's followed up nicely uh, with the likes of Chain of Corruption, Tivers, and that crescendo coming out there. But right now, Gambit looking like they're uh, quite happy with what's happened to them in the past couple of minutes. Kind of back away, do a bit of shopping. In the meantime, the Twisted Fate there with Charu, obviously, started to do a little bit of split pushing. I think that's something that's going to have to happen for them to hold Gambit off their aggressive ways. And I like his build for that because he rushed at Rabidon's Death Cap, which gives him so much AP, he is pretty much guaranteed to one-shot Minion ways with wild cards. Like normally you see Lich Bane and that gives you good damage on turrets, or you see something like, you know, fast sorcerer shoes and, and, and all that kind of stuff, or the zonias for sort of getting ganks to happen, but he is trying to kill off minion waves and force Gambit around. He's actually trying to get them too late game by constantly pulling pressure around the map. So same twist of fate we've been seeing 
you know, it's, it's clearly it's choice of fate. We've seen this champion before, but he's playing it in his way in order to create opportunities. He's got double teleports. He can go anywhere he wants and keep stretching Gambit out. There's Darren just pushing out that wave once again. He's extending that lead uh, over Kubon's cannon by a pretty large amount. I mean, he's almost 50 CS that he leads by right now. So he has died two times, but... That's almost typical Darian by yep. now. We almost expect that to happen to him. And if he can keep pushing, you know, on these lanes, forcing people to come and deal with him, then he's gonna be a trouble for meeting makers. And this is kind of interesting because it's something that Gambit Gaming does so well is they actually manage to get farm on all three of their sort of carry laners, as well as Diamond, who's keeping up as well at 96. Whereas Meet Your Makers, they realize they're trying to funnel to Mockler, right? He is the most important champion on this lineup come late game. They want to get Kog'Maw fed. And so anytime there's an open lane, they say, Mockler, it's you. You get this farm here. We need to make sure that you're the guy. And of course, Charu can get anywhere he wants, so he's able to pick up farm easily as well. Kubans have to pick up the scraps, which is very difficult for him. Yeah, especially if you're missing the shurikens like in that last wave. But you now, once Makla comes in, he's he's kind of uh, second fiddle when it comes to the farm there anyway. Yeah. There's a pink ward put down to make sure that they've got that vision of the mid lane. Charu himself nicely farmed up at 187. That is a little bit behind. But he's only 120 gold behind overall when you can, uh, compare him to Alex Hitch's Annie. Now that Twisted Fate pass was really helping keep the team up right here. A 2,000 gold difference is, is not massive. And you, we keep talking about those minion kill differences, right? And, and they're certainly there, and, and it's part of the reason that Gambit are ahead. But the team that's equal in turrets, up two dragons, equal in kills, up in minions, only 2,000 gold difference is that Twisted Fate passive. So Charu is passively helping the team. Another reason to have that Twisted Fate inside. And, uh, yeah, or a zillion uh, on the other side as well, which is not something that we've seen uh, uh, very often, but I mean, you make us have running. They have. They, they like those passives that help out everyone Where's at the, the same time. Where's the Janna? Where's the Janna? So, Alex actually headed up towards his top side there, maybe looking to try and head Kuban off, but Meet Your Makers doing a typical Meet Your Makers thing, which is putting as many wards as they can down onto the uh, enemy jungle once they get those outer turrets down. Uh, you can see the top side, you can almost trace the route that Libby can take <laughs> up there to, uh, to put all those wards in position and get that vision up. Meanwhile, Makla is pushing that bottom lane out as well. He's had a good two or three waves of farm coming his way, and he's starting to build again another health healthy lead up over Genja. Yeah, so this is interesting because Meet Your Makers, if they can actually get their lanes pushing down, they can actually utilize those wards and force engagements. They've got Jarvan who can get over walls, start engagements and, and pick people off. You've got Charu and Twisted Fate who can teleport in and make those things happen. And if Kuban can actually be pushed up so that he can participate in that fight, they can catch Diamond out, make things happen and, and get themselves back a lead to make the position to late game a little bit easier for them. The problem is they're having a hard time doing this. They Gambit are constantly sending people to the right places, keeping their lanes off their own turrets, and, and allowing this to, to, you know, stopping this from actually happening. Finally, it seems to be cracking here, Beecher Makers. Kubon is probably going to get this top turret. Yeah, that would be a nice little pickup for them as well, although Genja is, I think he was thinking about coming over there and realized, okay, by the time I get there, it's probably gone anyway. Let's take the golems away while I'm there. Why not? Yeah, there's lopsided vision on this side of the map is, is the thing to really point out here. You've got a lot of blue wards on the top side, only one ward for Gambit in that, that upper jungle, and, and so Genja sort of realized that there's... He has no idea who's waiting in the wings. Can Charu show up? Can Makata show up? I have no idea. And now here comes the fun thing, because Mini Makers can shove this top lane to go for another turret as a response to Dragon. And, yeah, they've cleared out that wall there. We see that Destiny's going to be popped as Kubon is going to go in. There is the Destiny coming onto him. He gets knocked up by Jarvan. Easy peasy kill there onto Genja. And now they are going to have this turret away. There are three of them hammering away. It. They're going to lose Dragon. That's the third one of the game for Gambit, but they're going to take the inner turret. And that's a worth it turret right there. Getting a secondary turret for Dragon at any time in the game with any circumstances is usually a good call for you because it opens up uh, so many opportunities. Because now Charu, if they can keep that top lane pushed out, Meet Your Makers can't, or sorry, Gambit can't sit on the bottom side of the map. Charu teleports to a minion, and that inhibitor is going down. If he goes Lich Bane next, which it might be off of that amplifying tome, that turret will die so fast. Oh, I see. Nice trying fight. to outsmite each other. Makata getting the better of that one. Diamonds was down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I say outsmiting, I mean, you know, out, just, just smiting. He pressed D. <laughs> it, was really, it was really impressive. <laughs> Sometime between the burst that you get from rank one tiger stance and smite, he managed to press the button. So, Kata, good job. Um, teach St. Vicious a lesson. Yeah. I mean, 
He's, he's, he had no one to go up against there, so uh, Makata won that battle, let's just say that. That's a good one for him. Uh, Makali, you can see, starting to really rip through now. Got that Phantom Dancer headed in towards his Blade of the Ruin King, guessing that that last Whisper will be his next port of call, with that uh, pickaxe already in there. Jarvan on the other side uh, just picked up a extra Giant Belt. Uh, we've already got the, uh, the Zonya's Hourglass as well for Keren, which... Once we actually get to a team fight, which has not really happened yet, that's going to be a big thing. And this is interesting as well because you look at at the build. This is not what I've seen from Charu for a while. You you don't need Void Staff to clear up minions. This is actually it's weird because it's like it's a wild card based build here. He's getting as much AP damage as possible to the entire team. Why didn't actually help AOE the lineup here? It's not Lich Bane, which is single target burst, or even turret pushing right here. It's this weird hybrid of, I just want to do as much caster damage as possible. I, I'm excited to see it pan out here, but this is a different build from what we saw last time. He is realizing he didn't do much damage last time, so I want to do a lot of damage now. The problem is he's facing not one, but two runic bulwarks from the front line of Gambit. Diamond and Darren are going to be really freaking hard to kill, and I guess the, the magic pen helps mitigate that which, especially a Twisted Fate with Teleport as well, you'd expect that maybe turret pushing is something that they Got could it. aim for with that one, but I'm not going to argue with these guys, that's for sure. We've seen Charu bring out some fantastic Twisted Fate in the past. We'll see how this one all works out here today. We've got that Rabadon's Death Cap now added in uh, for Alex Itch's Annie as well. Uh, double Runic Bulwark, we've already talked about that one. Bloodthirster and Last Whisper so far for Genja as they start to put down some damage onto this inner turret in the mid lane. And you can see Genja has gone for a similar build that we saw last game. It's the Bloodthirster Last Whisper build. He's got amazing long range poke. And just like last time, there's really no healer here for Meet Your Makers. If that poke lands, it's going to stick right here. You saw Libic has actually bought up, unless they were there from the beginning of the laning phase, he's got health potions here to say, if I take poke, I want to get back to full health and still be here to team fight. Mockler, though, he's, he's in dive range right here. Yeah, in dive range. What are they going to go for? It's, it's really Diamond that we've got to watch for with that one. Aatrox, of course, can jump out of nowhere almost, especially here where that corner of the, uh, the, the kind of jungle area isn't that deep and you can get over the top of it. But it's going to be Diamond who you know, sticks on the bear sands and goes charging in like a bit of a hero uh, to get things started off. Interesting to see, by the way, how stacked up the tier is now from uh, Genji. We actually talked about it earlier 384. on. 384. 384. So, you know, it's, it was obviously going to be slower than an Ash, but he is slowly getting there as we do see them pushing in now. This turret taking a good chunk of damage as Makla turns on Diamond. And there's that percent health damage that we were talking about that is going to be vital the longer the game goes on. Yeah, and even Diamond's running health potions as well to realize he's going to take some of that damage, wants to sustain it. And the interesting thing actually here, I talked about the Void Staff against minions. Now realize that Runic Bulwark does affect minions. It actually affects them at, at 1.5x uh, powers. So it's actually 37 and a half magic resist to these minions, which actually makes them too tanky to really die easily to, to wildcard. You're seeing them get dropped low but not die. And that Void Staff actually does help. I take it back. Just seen Destiny pop there, and that was for Charu to go up to this top lane and farm away. It's, it's, he's got almost that extra ace in his deck here with the teleports come <laughs> back into it if, it if an actual fight kicks off there. So whereas a normal team would be say, well, Twist of Fate's gone top lane, let's maybe get under the turret. You've got to watch out with this team. But look at him right there. He's actually recalling back next to his own turret because they might have been stuck in their own base so long they have no ward coverage. They can't let him keep split pushing up that side. And so Gambit, right, they're able to push in the mid lane. MYM has no idea where they're going right now. Well, I mean, they know a little bit right there with the ward over that wall, but they're pretty much back into darkness already. There is that big wolf taken away. Diamond just started to back off as he saw Jarvan coming in. But Meteor Makers now looking like they want to make sure that Vision is down. And they're going to try and make a positional play here on Gambit by shoving straight up the middle. This is an impressive move right here. They've got the opportunity to do this. They've got a mini wave here as well. And they decide, no, let's not take a team fight. We'll just steal away blue. They're, they, they should take it. I mean, they were really pensive there, but they can. And they are finally going to go around, I think, realizing, okay, Gambit are going to react to that middle play. Let's take away the blue buff. And, of course, it's Charu that gets that one uh, for him. It's Genja who uh, picked up the blue buff over on the other side. But right now, Gambit are still drifting around this Baron. They've had that Oracle on Darker for a little while, so they know that there are no wards down on the Baron itself. 
and they've just stood on one. But other than that one that they've just taken out, Baron is completely open. There's no vision there for Meteor Makers. Yeah, Gambit are in basically full darkness here. The thankful thing for Meteor Makers, they have really, really, really good brush checking. They've got Kogma, they've got Zyra, and they've got Kennen and Jarvan, all of whom have low cooldown ways of seeing, are you in this brush? Are you here? Are you doing that? So even if wards get swept out, Meteor Makers should never have to face check anything. They can scout it from a thousand range away or more. Right now they're hanging around for Dragon, which is going to actually spawn for them. And they're going to be able to take one away. That's a uh, nice little pickup for them. Actually, we'll bring the gold right back to almost even once again. So this is a, a very, very close game. 400 gold separates these guys. Meet your makers. Have a team fight cop. Now, Gambit does as well, to be fair. Their, their front end initiation is very, very strong. And let's look at the major players. Look at the gold right here. 11,000 puts of bait, 11,000 on Kog'Maw. Those are the guys who have been getting all the farm, and you're seeing it right there. Now, at the same time, 10,000 on Genjin, 10,000 on Alex. They're actually behind individually. So even though Gambit's winning as a team, the individual scores are higher for the two biggest playmakers. Look at this. Destiny going to be popped here just to make sure that they're safe or not. To split push is what Charu is going for. He's going into this top lane right now. Gambit are going to have to reply to this one because they could end up losing a inhibitor turret from all of this. This is huge because you get the summoner teleport back and make it a 5v4 and dive this turret. Well, he is going to have Genja coming his way Here to stop this one. There is that teleport. Going to be coming down, and he joins straight in onto the fight. He's got that Sheen now as well, so he's going to be doing a little bit more extra damage from that. And they do take down in inner turret number two. Great play out of Meteor Makers, and that's that's what you expect to see out of a Twisted Fate with teleport. That that was a worth a teleport right there. Chiro played that exactly right. Again, because the inhibitor is worth so much, you must recall to defend a Twisted Fate. You absolutely must do that right there. Gambit just checks and realizes, damn it, you got the dragon last time. There's nothing for us to do here. We can try try for Baron, but you're probably not going to be able to get that one. Um, they're actually moving towards it, though. This is They're, they're going to pull attention for Meteor Makers or possibly rush it down in time. Yeah, the funny thing is that MYM aren't really in a position to talk, uh, to do anything about this one. I mean, they've got Twisted Fate, who's got no Destiny, got no Teleport for a while. Jarvan's coming up there. His smite is available. That could be a big thing coming in. But the rest of the team are too far behind, and Gambit might be able to actually take this one away before MYM can do anything about it. It's down to 2,000 HP already. Is Alex Hitch going to flash over? Makata goes in, tries to get the Steelers. Kubo jumps in on top of them as well. That will be Drag uh, Baron going down for Gambit here as Darian takes a lot of damage. He's going to come back up thanks to his passive. Crescendo comes across the side of them. Diamond now going to focus on towards Libic, can, uh, onto Kubon. Can they finish him off on this one? He's burning. Will end up dropping down. And now Diamond goes in there. Bear stands. There comes a piercing arrow. And this is looking like it's going to be an ace. Aatrox jumps in for the double kill. And it will be an ace and the Baron for Gambit. Really well played team, but right there they focus down Makata at the very, very beginning there, did not let him get across the wall. Flash, Cataclysm, everything was up, and Alex bursted him out right there, despite all the help on Jarvan, and that meant Diamond could take the Baron on his own, and then you just saw the front line get melted down, melted down, the DPS so high, but one of the major initiators can't land his spells. Talk about damage coming in as well as buildings. Not worth much once this uh, Gambit attack force is on it, and you know, they've got a full bottom lane here to clear out the outer turret still stands, but those super minions are going to start streaming into the base. Gambit going to have a decent amount of cash to spend here. Two and a half thousand for Genja. Three thousand eight hundred for Darian to spend when he goes home. That's a lot of cash. He can get pretty much whatever he wants. You can go double guardian angel on Aatrox, but makes it so incredibly hard to deal with him. You actually, I actually like Darian's build here because he went bloodthirster, right? Okay, okay he had a runic bulk and all that, but he's such a high damage threat that he was actually focused down a second to Alex Itch in that team fight and then revived back up and was like, okay, it's 4v2, no big deal. Yeah, a guardian angel would make him slightly annoying, let's say that. And that it also puts in a bit of doubt in MYM's mind there. Like, who do you focus in that scenario? That's an Aatrox that is around in that fight for a heck of a long time, whether you focus him or not. So I will have to see about that one and what <laughs> route he decides to go. Well, he could just go double bloodthirster and make us all happy. That's going to be <laughs> awesome. Darian, I mean, not only with the blood well, but bloodthirst is... Wait, what if it's a build that's called bloodthirst? He's just role-playing at this point. <laughs> Dear God. All right, so uh, Darian is a really big damage threat here. He's going to want to wait on the Bloodwell coming back up. He's got, uh, I would say, about two minutes left on the Bloodwell cooldown right here. So I don't know if Gambit wants to wait for that because they'll time out there at this point. But it is worth noting that Darian is fairly easy to kill with Bloodwell down. 
he did pick up a giant belt as well there. We should uh, mention on top of his uh, of his bloodthirster as well. Or was that already there? He got that as part of the okay. as part of the big buy. It's part of his uh, I think four thousand gold yeah. by the time he actually went back, which we don't have to say it's a big spike of damage that Darian's gonna have uh, coming back in. Right now though he may walk into a trap. There is Libic and Kubon waiting in this brush. The question is, well, now they probably don't want to go for this one as the bear is going to start roaring out and they're going to realize that one's happening. Kogmo actually coming in from this backside and looks like Gambit not going to go for this fight. They may just wait until Alex comes around this side though. He's running the elixirs right now, so he wants that extra extra last bit out of, out of, if I can talk, out of everything that Annie can throw down. There's one minute left on Baron. This is this is the time for Gambit to just take control of everything right there. They, they've got Baron, they've got an inhibitor dead. They can make their way into the base very, very heavily. They're gonna take as much as they can. And Darian just doesn't care about damage. There's a chain of corruption gonna come out here on towards Libby. He's a dead man. They focus over on towards Kuban. There's a great crescendo coming out of Darker. Focusing on towards Makla. Makata gonna actually cataclysm right on top of them. Darian off the side here is very, very low from this one. They're gonna have to try and back away, but they've got Baron still here. That's gonna be regening them up. Diamond, even though he looks like he's low, it's kind of deceptive once that turtle comes out as well. And that will be inhibitor number two going through. And the super Super minions streaming in, they may be able to finish it. I don't think Makla can one can 2v5 this right here with Makata. They could try, but the the turrets are going down. This could be Gambit's game. Yeah, this is gonna be Gambit's game right here. Super amounts of damage coming down from all sides. Second Nexus turret will actually fall here, and they wait around. Are they gonna go for more kills? That'd be typical Gambit fashion at this point, but they focus finally onto the Nexus and take down Meet Your Makers. 11 5 in kills at the end, and Annie and an Aatrox in one game. Didn't think we'd be seeing that here this week, but Gambit showing that they've got some tricks up their sleeves. There's a triple A game from them right there. Honestly, great plays. That Baron call was what it was all about. The early mid game was very, very close. These guys found openings on each side. The kill score very, very close by. Um, Meet your makers with that amazing move there, you know, destined to the top lane, teleporting back down, getting a free turret for it. And then that one call, Gambit saying we can take Baron. They're split apart immediately just jumping on and bursting down the Jarvan jungle. And then it was like, all right, the team fights ours from here. I'm wondering how ready Meet Your, Mer uh, Meet Your Makers were for Aatrox. No. I, I have to wonder that. You saw Kubon's face at the end. It was kind of like the, the scrunched up face of, hmm, that was, um, didn't really know what was going to happen in that one. You know, and he played to the strengths of Aatrox there as well. You know, the, the regen that he gets anyway out of his abilities. Double Bloodthirster coming in there. He had a runic bulwark early on, getting himself a giant split like Really hard to kill a champion like that. Aatrox is a very, very good split pusher. He's got escape ability. He's got actually dive potential. So if you try too hard to kill him and you get a counter gank there, you've got really good follow-up, a knock-up, and a slow, and a lot of damage output there. You actually saw him dual cannon at one point there. And basically, once you get the first couple levels out of the way, and he actually opened up Dora's Shield to keep those first couple levels a little bit closer, yeah. once you get out of the way there, you're actually pretty much strong. You saw Darian actually start to bully Kuban around. He's got too much sustain. He's got really, really good burst. And again, Kuban can't all in. That's what Kennen does. He tries to all in. And he got a guy with a revive. You're yeah. just going to categorically beat Kennen there. You got a guardian angel built into your kit as well, which is always going to help. Uh, let's talk about the Annie as well, because she kind of became oh, Annie. And then they picked in Aatrox. So we didn't really talk that much about Annie yeah. in the end. Second time that we've seen her in as many weeks here. Ended up 4 1 2 there, did Alex. Fell behind a little bit on the CS, but you know the burst potential alone, and you know that AOE stun coming out from Annie is is something that you can never underestimate. His build is really clever. So he went for uh, the early Hextech revolver into the uh, Spirit of the Spectral Race, with very high sustain, low cooldowns, and could kind of keep refreshing that cooldowns. Very important for Annie to get her burst through, uh, to get another stun ready, keep doing it throughout the fight. And by having sustain, grabbing a Spirit Visage there as well, she could keep getting her health back up in the fight. She's a short range caster like Rise, but doesn't build, you know, Seraph's Embrace, things like that. So she found ways to keep tanky in those fights and keep putting spells out. Smart play from Gamit and a fantastic win for them. We're going to head over to Jason to break down the game. Thank you for that, Joe and Demon. And an exciting game it really was. It started off a little bit slow. I will say that I'm pretty sure everyone here can really agree with that. But seeing Aatrox for the first time in North America and Europe, seeing him in the top lane, well, technically, whatever lane he wanted to go to, but onto Darien. And then seeing Annie yet again for the second time in EU LCS, it was really... It was really underwhelming at first, I have to say, but it all came down to that one fight at Baron that we saw where Gambit was finally able to get their entire CC chain going. We're going to go hit the replay on the screen and just walk you through exactly what happened and show you kind of how the overlay of CC really worked out well for, uh, for Gambit. So, as you can see, they're already in pit here. They have 
Uh, Meech Breakers has a little bit of vision on the Baron, so they know pretty much exactly what's going to be happening here. Makati's going to try to go in, but look at Annie. Has that stun ready, is totally ready to just get over that wall right onto him. So we can start the replay up and just show you how this kind of develops. And also make sure to know, Lipic is not really here just yet. So there it is. Alex is going to go over the wall. He's going to actually get the knockup. We're going to pause it right here real quick. Because uh, that was actually very fast. Um, but you did see, so Alex stunned uh, onto Jarvan, onto Makati, and then they followed up with the Aatrox knockup. And then, of course, we're going to see a Zyra ultimate come down right here. And I, I want to point this out specifically, because if you're looking at Genja, he's, he's in a position to either get away from it or pretty much, uh, you know, either front or back. And as we're going to start this up, you're going to see him flash backwards. And the Zyra ultimate just pretty much zones out completely Gambit right here as Darren's left all alone. And as you heard, Joe and, you know, uh, uh, Wow, I actually forgot his name for a second. Freak talking about it. It's pretty much a built-in guardian angel right there, and they're able to pretty much leave him all alone by himself and pretty much just follow up with kill after kill. And that's pretty much it for the replay, but you just saw the CC, you know, the Annie Sun mixed in with the Crescendo, mixed in with the Varus Ultimate, completely shut Meteor Makers down. They weren't able to get that, and the entire game leading up to that point, about 33 minutes, not much happened, but it's all in that one part, at uh, one point you need. Getting that first Baron, getting it locked down for your team, getting five kills and the Baron all at once for Gambit, which is too much for Meteor Makers to handle, and obviously they came out with a win. So we're going to head over to Shock Snow, who has an interview with Alex Itch. <laughs> all right, I'm here with Alex. Congratulations. Great match. Uh, first, got to talk about the Annie pick, of course, and you going...